Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I know we're probably weighed down by lunch and snacks, but I'll try to keep you awake for the next 20 minutes or so to talk about uh, some bike stuff. Uh, my name is Brendan Murphy. I'm the lead researcher at a little research group here at the University of Minnesota called the Accessibility Observatory. We're housed within the Center for Transportation Studies, and we analyze transportation systems and networks, um, transit, bike, auto, ped, in terms of how well they get us to places that matter to us. Our primary metrics are access to jobs, but we do access to healthcare locations or acres of parkland and things like that. And we do spatial econometrics analysis to look at how our transportation networks change over time. And I'm here to talk about a project that I worked on a lot over the past year of using OpenStreetMap data for the entire country of the United States to analyze how well those bike networks let us get to job opportunities um, and also incorporating something called level of traffic stress. And I'll unpack all of that over the next 15, 20 minutes or so. This is the report that we released this summer. It's called Access Across America, Biking 2017. There's a lot of stuff that rolls up into this map and this list here, and I'll do my best to kind of unpack things for you and, and guide you through it. But the end result is that we can say which cities provide the best access by bicycle to job opportunities. And of course, New York's number one, but Minneapolis here, where we are this weekend for State of the Map US, is number seven. Hmm, that's pretty cool. A little bit about the background here. Uh, we needed to figure out how to measure bike access to destinations. Another consideration is not all roads are equal and not all routes are equal for bikes. Some are less safe, um, some are more preferable than others, some have paths that are really good to use and people prefer them. So we need to have quantified uh, ways to con ways to to, uh, to work with those considerations. And thirdly here, we need a systematic uh, classification system to classify roadways for how bikeable they are uh, because we're wanting to do this on a national scale. Accessibility is, uh, very briefly, the ease of reaching valuable destinations, and it's a way for us to quantify this. So we use shortest path routing from an origin to all possible destinations, and you set a time limit, say you have 30 minutes. You travel on your network, you count up where you can get to, and then you count up the number of, say, job opportunities at all of the destinations that you can get to and assign that number to your origin. You do that for all possible origins in an area you're interested in, and then you get your map and you get your data. So we can say things, for instance, the average person in a city, say Minneapolis or St. Paul, might be able to reach 10,000 jobs in 30 minutes on the bike path network. That's just a hypothetical example. And this is what we call a cumulative opportunity metric. A quick overview of the methodology. We use the tag data in OpenStreetMap. So uh, ideally, all roadways have tag information about whether or not there is a bicycle facility, about the number of traffic lanes, about the prevailing speed, um, and other geometric properties of the roadway or intersection that give us an idea of how a cyclist might feel biking on that roadway, if they might be comfortable or if they might be a little bit uncomfortable if they're dealing with um, not having space dedicated to them or dealing with a lot of car traffic. Once we have that heuristic figured out, we tag roads as one, two, three, or four. That's one from the lowest stress possible to four is the highest stress possible. And we do this for the entire country. We then tag intersections based on the stress factors of the roads that connect at the intersections. And this is basically, if it's a controlled intersection, if there's a traffic light, then the intersection is assigned the lower stress factor because you can stop, the more stressful road traffic will be stopped and you'll be free to cross when the light is green. If it's an uncontrolled intersection, we assign the higher factor of all of the connecting roadways. Once we do that process, we can then calculate our accessibility metric, which again is access to job opportunities at the census block level but only using, say, the lowest stress ways that we labeled in an area, or the one and the two ways, or the one and the two and the three, and so forth. So we get four possible levels of access based on how comfortable you might be as a cyclist. 
And once we do that, we can compare at the city level and between cities nationally to look at how well bike networks do across the country. About the tool chain and data, we use Census LEHD data, which is the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program. It gives us information about the uh, census block locations of workers in terms of where their jobs are and where their homes are. And that lets us calculate the access to the job opportunities. And then when we roll it up into weighted individual figures for a city, we weight by the population in each census block. Using OSM, that gives us the bicycle, tra bicycle travel network and the ways and nodes that we need for routing. For routing purposes, we use Open Trip Planner, which gives us a way to do shortest path routing calculations on a large scale. And for parallelization, we use the um, EC2 service via AWS. Uh, when we're running our national calculations every year, we're using eh, a week's worth of time on 20 EC2 instances at the same time. Uh, cores are you know, on the order of 64 and 256 gigabytes of memory. So this is a lot of computation. Why we're using OSM is because it's open source. That's why we're all here. It's great. It's community managed and national coverage. This lets us give a pretty uniform baseline to uh, informing our calculations and allows us to compare city to city. Obviously, we all hopefully know about the data quality issues and so forth that we can come uh, into contact with in areas where there uh, may be fewer people working on the uh, uh, on OSM, but uh, since we're primarily looking at cities and comparing urban data, uh, we assume that there's a generally a pretty good level of quality. There's hopefully, uh, in, in the areas that we're analyzing, a robust uniform tagging system. Um, and lastly, uh, a nice benefit of using OSM data is that OSM users tend to be pretty engaged and involved around um, active transportation and biking and transit access and other uh, connected and interrelated urban issues. So about the LTS classifications, this um, will give you a little bit better picture, and I promise I have pictures and, and map images here too. Um, the first level is canonically residential streets, there's very little traffic, um, or protected uh, and off-street bicycle facilities. Those might be the lowest stress and you might be comfortable biking with your kids on them. Number two, one step up, these are slower streets with mixed traffic, maybe good on-street bike lanes that don't have physical barriers for protection. One more step up is the third level. These are faster streets, these might qualify as secondary roads in the primary, secondary, tertiary sort of classification system. And lastly, we have primary roads that might be arterials and they don't have bicycle facilities on them. Um, a note about the primary, secondary, tertiary system is we fall back on that uh, classification system of roadways if the tag information for a given OSM way doesn't tell us anything about the number of lanes or the traffic speed. Um, or other geometry that we need to use to inform our, our considerations. So I've got some picture examples of the classifications. Uh, this one on the top left is actually right over here on Oak Street, uh, here on campus of the University of Minnesota. And it's a parking buffered protected bikeway. And it runs from our campus a couple blocks down to the river where you can connect to a, a river path. Two, this is a, an ex another example from Minneapolis. This is uh, Park Avenue in South Minneapolis. There is a, a double buffer bike lane on both Park Avenue and Portland Avenue. And this is an example where you get a lot of space, but they're not physically protected. A shoulder bike lane on an arterial might qualify as LTS3, since you have space given to you, but eh, it's kind of subpar. And lastly, this is Snelling Avenue, in, right near the Snelling and University uh, intersection over this way a bit in St. Paul. And you, you wouldn't want to bike here. <laughs> a quick note, uh, we're not the only people doing this kind of work. This is something from People for Bikes in uh, Boulder, Colorado. They have something called the uh, Bike Network Analysis Tool or Analyst Tool. And they're doing this on a city by city level. 
Um, so they also use OSM data and they do very similar cl uh, classification to us of using the tag information and roadway attributes to classify roadways as high stress or low stress. On the bottom right here, it's blue or red. They're only doing low stress or high stress. They're not really break. They actually break it down into four, but then one of their steps is to group one and two together and three and four together to simplify their classification system. And all down the left here, these are different opportun um, opportunity destinations. So they're looking at access to dentists, doctors, grocery stores, uh, a wider variety of things. So their metric is a little bit different. Um, and they wind up with a meta score at the top left of how, how well you can reach a variety of things based on the low stress access. Our methodology is, is kind of based on, on some of the work that they do. So now we get to some maps uh, based on our work. This is what you see when you map out the OSM network in Minneapolis and the surrounding area of only looking at the lowest stress ways that we've labeled as LTS1. And then we can add the blue, that's LTS2. Still some gaps in downtown Minneapolis and around. This is what we would consider as the, the low stress bike network of the one plus the two. If we add three, I hope this isn't too hard to see, the orange is uh, the third tier. So a little bit higher stress, but still you might be able to bike there if you're brave enough. And going all the way up to four, the red lines are where I might not even bike. <laughs> um, but this gives you a complete picture of how we label um, our roadways here um, via this kind of classification system. And we can also do for other cities. This is an example of Washington, DC. They have a lot of, a lot of arterials in and out of the downtown core. And that's been a challenge for uh, DC DOT to address when they're trying to build out their, their low stress bike network. So those are the under underlying networks. These are the access maps that we can create with the accessibility data we generate. What we're looking at is a census block heat map essentially with each census block colored by the number of jobs you can reach by biking within 20 minutes. And this is for the lowest stress roadways only. We can tick it up to LTS2. So your numbers go up a little bit. Again, LTS3, your numbers go up a little bit because you're expanding the roadways that you're allowing yourself to travel on. And finally to four. So we have, this, we have these data, we have these cool maps, but what can we do with it? We can compare the two, we, we, we can compare the access levels between the different types of bike networks that we're looking at. And we can say things like, if every road felt as safe as an off-street path, people could reach 10,000 more or 50% more jobs than those that are reachable on just the low stress bike network. And we can do this on an individual census block level or an entire city level. We can talk about what might be considered as an access gap. Um, underserved communities may serve to uh, they stand to gain with more low stress networks being built into them. And we can use this to spatially identify areas that benefit from new bike infrastructure investments. Oh, and we, we call uh, the level four um, open streets because uh, it's kind of named after the, our open streets events here or in the same psychology where you close off streets and you can walk and bike and there aren't cars there. Open streets accessibility to us is if a street felt as safe like that to bike on or if there weren't cars, you could bike everywhere and that's your level of access at LTS4. This is a map of uh, that difference that I'm talking about. Um, so the lighter colored areas Excuse me. The lighter colored areas uh, show that you can, on the bike network, reach a larger percent of the jobs that you could reach by biking everywhere. So that level four is your reference, and the access you experience on the bike network is what we're comparing. And the lighter colored areas, you have a, a higher percentage of access. 
The darker colored areas, you have a lower percentage of access, which means maybe your bike network there isn't as well built out. Maybe there aren't as many good bike lanes there and so forth. So that can help us identify uh, darker colored areas where we need to do better. And this is a data page that, uh, this is an example of one of the pages that we have in the report that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. This is for Minneapolis. There's a lot here, um, but I'll just unpack a couple things. The first graph here shows us the uh, access to jobs numbers at every time threshold. So we can do this for any time budget. And this shows 10 minutes on the left through 20, 30, 40, all the way up to an hour of travel time. And the orange line is for the quote unquote medium stress, which is one plus two plus three uh, streets. And the low stress is the one plus the two. And the chart on the bottom here, this is what's what, one of the things I'm, I'm really excited about is that we can compare, as I showed in this map, we can compare accessibility between the uh, networks for LTS 1, 2, and 3 to that open streets reference point of where you could get to if you could ride everywhere. Um, and the circled figure on the right here, that's the percentage of jobs you can reach on the overall bike network as a percentage of where you could get if you could bike everywhere. Minneapolis has a 77.8 percentage here, and that's number one in the country. So go Minneapolis. We've got, a, we've got a lot more work to do in this kind of area, but we're doing not so bad already, and we beat Portland. <laughs> <laughs> so a quick note on implications in future work. This lets us, again, ID areas of bike networks for improvement. We can talk about equity um, by looking at which populations of people are disadvantaged most by uh, lack of bike networks. We can inform policy and planning by doing things like scenario analysis or analyzing project by project. If we know a new bike lane is going to be installed, what does that do to our access levels? We can explore ways to analyze the bike networks directly um, by looking at things like connectivity, identifying islands that are disconnected from the rest of the network and so forth, and talk about how to connect um, different sub-networks together to enable people to get more places. And lastly, we can have uh, this kind of research inform conversations around improving OSM classification of bike facilities. So thank you very much. I think I've got maybe a minute or two for questions. Uh, the question was, any thoughts about the last point? Great question. Um, yes, <laughs> I would love to see greater consistency in the labeling of bike facilities. Um, I think a still open question is how to handle buffered bike lanes and sharrows. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's a whole range of different solutions that we've implemented within the uh, transportation planning world, which is kind of where I come from. Uh, to, ha to help bicyclists get around and to help them wayfind. And we do a pretty good job in OSM of, of, of classifying and including that information, but uh, we, you know, there, there's so many different solutions out there that we need to make sure that we're doing a good job of keeping them all in the same place. Remember cyclopath? Cyclopath. Uh, cyclopath, yeah, I do remember cyclopath. Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Do you have a trip somewhere that you would use to convert the Yeah, I do. Um, if you're curious, I can I can send you the GitHub repo. But the, the question was about um, what script I use to assign these values to OSM. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I'm working on that. <laughs> so uh, I'm in the process of generating a bunch of geo packages that will package up the access data and probably also the network data too. Um, I don't, unfortunately don't have a, a you know repo or a website built for that right now. Um, but if you get in touch with me, I can I can get your hands on some on some data. 
All right, I'm at my 20 minutes, so thank you very much.